I think I am back. Can you guys hear me now? Thank you. Yep. Um, we lost internet here, so that was the issue. Uh, and I, boy, I was on a roll. What was the What was the last thing you guys heard? Douglas Fairbanks. Fairbanks. Okay. All right. Good. All right. Let me. Let me. Uh, we're almost done with this section, so let me go ahead and uh, plow through this real quick. Um, so Francis Marion. Um, this partnership, she was, she was a journalist and a compact correspondent in World War I. She was the highest paid writer in Hollywood for 20 years. Um, then we have two directors um, who are the only, really, for all practical purposes, the only women working in the studio system during the sort of classic Hollywood studio system period. One of them is Dorothy Arzner, um, who also directs a lot of movies that are, are very socially conscious. She's the first woman to join the Directors Guild of America. Um, she's the first woman to direct a sound feature. We're pretty sure she is the person who invented the boom mic. Having trouble directing uh, this first sound feature of hers, she came up with the, uh, and, and, and as we saw from Singing in the Rain, you know, where the heck do you put the microphone? She came up with the idea of putting it on the end of a fishing pole. Um, and thus the, uh, if, if legend is correct, thus the boom pole, um, the boom mic was invented. The other director during this period of time um, is an, started off as an actress, a woman by the name of Ida Lupino, um, a very interesting director, worked, worked mostly in low budgets, but is, is the, the first woman to direct a film noir. Her, her, her movies are, are, can be very tough, but they also, again, deal with, with subjects that are very difficult to deal with during this period of time. Unwed pregnancy, uh, bigamy, rape, um, polio, um, and she is, in fact, the second woman to join the Directors Guild of America. Um, Again, we're more into a period now where we're seeing just how massive this underrepresentation is. If there are only two women working in the Hollywood studio system as directors, then, then, then that percentage of our population is massively underrepresented. I'll let you guys come back and also take a look at a very important uh, person in film history, um, Maya Darren, um, an experimental filmmaker from in the 40s and 50s. Um, not working in the studio system at all, just basically had a 16 millimeter camera, made these astonishing, dreamlike, big influence on, on David Lynch. Um, and then there are a few, you know, just different females working in the industry, different movies about women that you might want to consider. Okay, um, let's, let's now, I'm going well actually before we do that real quick um so winter's bone 2010 um it's it uh produced by a company called anonymous content um and also a production company set up as many movies are just for the production oh my gosh am I still on okay am I sharing right now all right hold no on. I wanted to share this real quick my apologies Okay. Um, distributed by a company called Roadside Attractions. Director is a woman, the name of Deborah Granick. Um, the producers are women, and Rossellini, who is also the co-screenwriter and is kind of Deborah Granick's producing and writing partner, um, and Alex Madigan, uh, who is the producer from uh, Anonymous Content. The screenplay is also written by women, uh, by Deborah Granick and, and Rossellini, but it is based on a novel written by a man, uh, Daniel Woodhull. The cinematography is by a guy named Michael McDonough. We'll talk about him more than likely a little bit today. Um, it was filmed on location in the Ozarks of Missouri, which I think is a very important part of this. And it stars um, Jennifer Lawrence in a very nascent period of her career. Uh, Gary Ross, who directed The Hunger Games, in fact, said that he cast her in The Hunger Games after having seen her work in Winter's Bone. So this is, although it's not her first film, this is the film that kind of launches her career. Okay. Um, let me throw it open to you guys now. What do you want to talk about in terms of Winter's Bone? 
I personally thought it was kind of boring. Okay, again, that's not a that's that. I, I need something more I can go on. <laughs> it felt like they were going for suspense, but the action and pacing was so drawn out and slow. I just lost interest by about halfway through it. I find that kind of uh, actually astonishing, but that's that's okay, right? You know, I, I will I will tell you what I tell my daughter. And she hates hearing this every time I say it. Um, and that is that things aren't boring. People are bored. Right. Mm -hmm. So if, if I don't find the movie boring, the movie can't be boring. So, you know, a lot of the times or, or great or, you know, things, this is our reaction to things. Um, and there's, there's, there's no right or wrong reaction. Um, so your issues are a slowness of pace, right? Let me let me ask you something, Nate. What are what are the movies you have a tendency to when you're when you're going to be entertained? What are the movies you have a tendency to watch? What are your favorite movies? Ironically, horror and suspense. Okay, N name name specifics. Specifics. What's uh, your favorite movie? Know. What's your favorite movie of all time? Yeah, I'd have to go with Repo the Genetic Opera. Okay, all right. Th this exactly just tells me a little bit more, right? So not exactly uh, a suspense movie, but yeah. No, no, but but um, it is a kinetic, a very kinetic film, which this film is obviously not trying to be. You know, one of the things we can mention here, um, and it may have to do with with you know your reaction to this. Um, uh, Deborah Granick um, has a background in documentary uh, filmmaking. And Deborah Granick's favorite kind of movie, um, and the things that she was taught when she was in college, is neorealism. Now we haven't seen a lot of neorealism. We've seen some clips. You've been you've watched some clips in this class. When we're talking about Italian neorealism, we're talking about the bicycle thieves. We're talking about Rome, Open City. Um, these are movies which. And also, we're thinking about this whole sort of, 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 of spectrum that goes from realism to formalism with classicism in the middle. Um, obviously, uh, neorealism leans into the realist side very strongly and therefore leans away from a lot of technical pizzazz. Um, that may lend these movies to having, you know, for, for what, especially, you know, for us it may seem, I mean, to me, it's not slow paced at all, but I'm, you know, I'm just trying to sort of figure, figure out um, what might lead to that, that, that sort of attempt. So it, it, it may have something to do with, you know, the, the kind of movie that Deborah Granick is trying to make. She's, and, and this has something to do also, we'll talk later about, you know, Deborah Granick's sort of, passage through the film industry. Um, she's really not interested in making blockbuster movies or big budget movies. She's really interested in making movies that are kind of about real people and have a, a sense of reality to them and are not you know, technically um, flashy. What else, guys? Anybody got a different opinion? What about um, the look of the yeah. film? Okay. The movie a lot. All right, Logan, go ahead. Sorry. That's okay. Um, I think it might have been probably one of my favorites that we've watched in this class. And I understand what Nate is saying, but I think it's not so much that the movie was boring as that he went in with the expectations that it was a horror and suspense movie. And it was more like, it seemed more like to me a character piece, if anything. Not that we got to really learn a lot about um, the character or whatever, but sort of, she was just sort of in a really vulnerable situation, sort of almost helpless. And she wasn't particularly like physically strong in any sense, but she had to go out and put herself in these dangerous situations constantly throughout the movie to try and save like what little she has and her family. And that's really just kind of what I saw through the whole movie was her doing that. 
Yeah, well, expectations are obviously a thing. I'm, I'm also looking at my PowerPoint right now and all my pictures have, have vanished for some reason. But one of the things I find interesting to think about in terms of, of this particular film is in fact genre. Um, and, and, and what what the genre might be or what genres are at play. So we already mentioned uh, neorealism. Um, I'll read a quote here from an article um, about Deborah Granick where Deborah Granick is saying, my esteemed mentor, Boris Fruman, showed us 100 slides of stills from films, says Granick. There would be a Georgian peasant with an enormous mole or a fisherman with one hand, and then he'd show us supermodels. He asked us to close our eyes at the end of the recall uh, and recall whom we remembered. No one remembered the supermodels. You can't remember perfection. Striving for idealized beauty is thin and has no lasting power. Um, that's actually not the quote I meant to read, but that's all right. Uh, it's a good quote anyway. Um, it's an, it's, I, I think one of the things to consider here, right, is the trend of, and I, and I think what this movie is doing is it's mixing, right? the trend of independent character-driven film, right? The trend of suspense thrillers, okay? Um, the author of the novel has described what he does as country noir. Um, Kenneth, Kenneth Turan, uh, the critic, was talking about this film. He said, it's got an independent film soul inside a B-picture body. The B-picture body comes from its driving plot, right? We've got a quest. Here's the thing. Here's a problem. This has got to be taken care of. What are the obstacles in my way? You know, how am I going to, how am I going to get through this quest? Um, the B-picture body comes from its driving plot. This is a quest story. The independent soul, sorry, I'm just realizing I misspelled soul or the computer did. The independent soul comes from the intense care given to characterization, right? Which is really what Deborah Granick is, is more interested in. We, we can imagine this movie as an independent sort of, of issue film without the issue of who murdered her father, where is her father, how am I going to find your father? This could be a character piece that just follows a young woman in these, these very troubled situations, just kind of trying to survive. How, how am I going to put dinner on the table? I'm going to have to go out and shoot a squirrel. How, you know, how, how, how am I going to take care of my mother? Right, it could just be that. It's got this other plot laid over it that helps drive this. And maybe that works for some people to have that combination, maybe it doesn't. Um, I'm sorry, go, go ahead, I think you've had something to say for quite a while, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Great. Uh, yeah, I was just, you already said it, I was gonna say that I saw it as like a, a hillbilly noir. It was kind of a noir mixed with a coming of age story, kind of, kind of, you know, her kind of a, her her loss of innocence. Um, it was it was a slower burn for sure, but there is kind of like a, a mystery feel where you kind of get the characters and you get little pieces of the characters and their lives as it goes that all you know tr kind of drastically alters how you view them. Like a teardrop, he kind of seems like a bully and a bad guy, but then you kind of see a bit more that the the story is a bit more complicated than that. You know that he's his involvement in all this is is precarious, and he's got to be very careful about how he does everything. And then, in a way, he was trying to kind of protect her by scaring her off. Yeah. You know? Well, I think it's all you know. It's a, a, a couple of things um, there. Um, th this may have something to do with expectations. I mean, I went first went into Winter's Bone thinking I'm going to see a low budget, independent, uh, issue based um female driven film and what i came away with was wow this is actually quite fast-paced and you know it has quite a driving narrative that i didn't expect to see so expectations may have something to do with it i, I think it's also worth 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 uh going back a little bit and talking a little bit about the function of teardrop um in the narrative um we often talk about characters as having an arc right something changes 
the, the, the things that batter them, change them as a character. Um, Rhee doesn't really have an arc. Rhee is pretty much the same person at the end of the movie she was at the beginning. That's kind of Rhee's strength, is that these events that happen around her don't change her, don't sort of batter her, don't make her a different person. But she has, as in a Western, I think you can also look at this movie kind of as a Western in a way. You know, she and t these people have codes of honor and conduct that they, that they stick to. It's Teardrop, though, that has the arc. Um, John, um, oh shoot, I'm forgetting his, I'm forgetting the actor's name. John, uh, I'm looking it up. John Hawks. John Hawks, thank you. Uh, John Hawks has said about his character in this film and his performance in this film that he did not change how he approached the character from the beginning of the story to the end of the story, from the beginning of production till the end of production. He played the same character. What he says is that our understanding of that character is what changes. Um, and, and that is, as, as you mentioned, uh, Braden, that is this idea that he first seems very harsh, he seems very uncaring, but we can later look back at that and think, well, maybe he's trying to protect her when it comes down to it and she's being practically beaten to death and looks like maybe she'll just end up in the same, we don't know this yet, but she'll end up in the same swamp that her father's in. Um, it's Teardrop that comes in and basically says, this is family, you don't do this. And they're all pretty frightened of him too, which I think is an interesting character point as well. And then it's Teardrop at the end that does something that, that, that Deborah Granick had to really convince John Hawks to do, because John Hawks wasn't sure his character would do it. Um, sit down at the end, play the banjo, and stay. All right? It is not Ethan Edwards. It is not the guy who performs the function and then walks off into the desert and the door closes and, and locks him outside. He stays. He stays and he does something very human. He does something kind of artistic. Um, and that's something that, that John Hawks and Deborah Granick really kind of had to, to struggle over to decide whether that was, was, was right or not for the character. Any follow up on that, Braden? Um, no, uh, just I guess that that I mean, with the pacing of it, I feel like some of it is slower, but there is kind of like things are kind of steady, kind of like you know shot very realistically, and then you do have moments where it gets very fast very quickly, mm -hmm. like in this scene where she first confronts Teardrop. I thought it was very interesting the way they did it. They have a very fast editing where it's like, and it's only like five shots probably, where um, he grabs her face, where he moves in on her. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting because all it is, and I, I'm pretty sure they jumped the line because the screen direction changes. Oh, I'll have but, to go look uh, at that. I think you might be right. Yeah, the screen direction changes, and it and it's all it is is it's his close up and her close up, and then she goes to speak, and he leaves his close up and then moves into her close up, and then it becomes an over the shoulder, and then it cuts to a profile, and then it and then it switches screen direction. It's very claustrophobic too. It's very right. tight. It's very yeah, threatening. I thought that was, yeah. I thought was a very interesting way to show kind of violence and aggression because you don't actually see his hands really or any of the body movements all you see is a face moving into another face yeah i thought that was pretty interesting so. yeah yeah i like that um you made me think of something i was going to say now I've, what was it um well I, you know i think to, to back up a little bit um the, the 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 cinematic approach the technical approach um the movie's all handheld um, the movie's all shot on location in real places. There's, there's, there's very little set dressing. Um, if a dog wanders into a shot, it's because a dog lives at that location where these people, where these filmmakers are shooting. Other than the main actors, everyone is a local, right? So basically what you've got is a group of filmmakers going into this environment and creating the story inside this environment and using this environment um, to help form that story. Um, and they, they, it doesn't feel like it's overly planned. 
right? I mean, it is a, a sort of a, a sense of haphazardness, a sense of capturing reality, a sense of documentary-like technique. That is, is and, and there's, a, there's a clip, uh, a behind the scenes clip in here. You can, you can see that to some extent, Deborah Granick doesn't always even direct the camera. You know, uh, the, the scene where, where Ree's brother and sister are just trying to, to get the, I think, find the peanut butter, I think is, all the animals have food names, by the way, if you notice, um, are trying to catch the dog is something that they shot quite a while and she just kind of told them to do this and run after this and, and the camera just kind of tried to follow it as best it could. So there is that sense of documentary realism where the filmmakers are kind of capturing things that are happening in front of them rather than specifically really sort of planning um, those things out. And you know, we can keep talking about the pace. The, the pace, the, the pace may be um, something that is, is once again an attempt to recreate the, this, the, the sense of the lives of these, of these people rather than impose a more dramatic or, so, and I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm not saying Nate is right or wrong. Uh, everybody has their own, own opinions, figure out, figuring out what you like and what you don't like, what works for you and don't worry. It's particularly important for you if you're going to be a filmmaker. Uh, so that's great. Um, but that may be, you know, again, another result of trying to capture this world the way it feels rather than a more melodramatic version of this world, say. What else, guys? What else can we talk about? Was it shot during winter or was that all done in post, the look of the film? Um, there's, I mean, obviously there's some post. Um, anything in particular you're thinking about, Evan? Just the like overall look of the film, really. Okay. Um, well, well, let me let me say this, and I'm, I want to pull up this particular quote. Um, the movie is, to some extent, first of all, from a color standpoint, desaturated. I think we would say, right? Um, the the director of photography kind of disagrees with that just a little bit. Let me let me read you something from um, a Q and A with Michael McDonough. Um, and also, you know, again, we're, we're, we're dealing with a movie that has a lot of blues, you know, leans into um, the blues um, because it's supposed to feel cold, right? So Michael McDonald says, as for the weather, which was often warm, we'd manage by adjusting the color temperature of the red camera, right? Creative use of filters and a final helping hand from Tim Stippen in the Technicolor suite where they were adjusting all the colors, doing the color timing and color correction. So that color sense is something that, that they create both in the camera and then sort of emphasize in, in, in post. But they did go in and do color, you know, color temperature corrections in the camera itself to kind of give it this bluer, colder feel. Um, continuing with Michael McDonald, Winter's Bone has generally been described as monochromatic or lacking in color or desaturated. I disagree. I think it's full of color. Subtle color, yes, which is kind of desaturated color. Um, but there are many moments where the golden color of a night interior is contrasted against the cool blue of a day. Or when we switch from the greens of a fluorescent interior of the cattle auction to the steel blue of the exterior cow pens, we also see a lot of color in the skin tones. It's almost like underpainting in oils, where a contrasting color is laid down first and elements of it peek through what is laid over it. Which, for those of you that are animation fans, by the way, is, the, is, is a description of what was done with Batman the Animated Series, where instead of drawing onto white paper, they draw to black paper. So that, that, that when, when, when the paper came through, it would be dark instead of light. Um, uh, a contrast of color is laid down first and elements of it peek through what's laid over. I see this a lot in Ree's close-ups, especially at dusk. So I think one of the things that Michael McDon McDonough is saying is, is we didn't just go in and turn the saturation down, right? Uh, this was a conscious decision to get these colors. Um, the other thing that Deborah Granick talks about is the fact that Michael McDonough is, is, is not the kind of director of photography who is bothered by mixing color temperatures. And one of the things that is quite often mentioned is the cattle auction, where when she's inside the cattle auction, 
Um, it's this very sort of sickly greenish yellow fluorescent kind of feeling, which is the natural color that they found when they went there. And when they go outside to the cow pens, when she's following um, Thump, um, what, what you then see is this very sort of blue nighttime cold exterior. And these, these colors are, are sort of mixed in a way that, that the, the, again, a, a feeling more towards realism rather than artifice. I think that is that does that deal with what you're thinking about, Evan? Yeah. Yeah. I know this is not your favorite film either. Is there is there something about the the look of the film that's bothering you? No, I was just curious about it because um, it does look very desaturated, and yeah. I was just because I know oftentimes movies are not shot when they take place, like weather and season wise. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think it would be at least in the fall because I thought I saw a lot of like dead trees. Maybe yeah, like I don't think they were shooting in the summer. I think um, w one of the things they talk about a little bit is originally, um, um, I, I think the scripting and even the, the, the novel itself talks a lot more about snow. Um, and there were lots of, of considerations about shooting this movie other than where it takes place, which happens all the time, right? So there were conversations about shooting in states, for example, that have better, um, uh, I think most of you know this, uh, different states, d depending on the state, not all states, but some states um, uh, have incentive programs to try to get movies to come in and film in their states. Because movies are kind of, you know, you don't have to build a bunch of roads for the movie. You don't, you know, it, it comes in, it drops some money, it leaves. It doesn't really have a big impact on the community, a negative impact on the community. So lots of states have these very, very intense um, um, incentive programs where they rebate tax money. Um, and, and so that's often a consideration of where a movie is shot. So there was some consideration that maybe they should shoot somewhere else because they could get a better incentive program than they were getting in Missouri. There was some considerations they might shoot somewhere else because it would be easier to find snow. The number of movies that chase snow is astonishing. If you ever want to see a story about chasing snow, look at some of the behind the scenes or documentaries about The Revenant. Um, it never snows when you want it to snow and it always snows when you don't want it to snow. Uh, I can tell you that from personal experience. Um, yep. But they decided it was more important to be in the authentic place. So I'm not so sure it would have been necessarily really warm like summertime, but I think from their perspective of, of, of what they felt like it should feel like to a viewer, it was a little bit warm. So they cool things off a bit in the color temperatures. Well, not even. It, it's interesting, you know, Evan, just want to say, it's interesting that we've got do the right thing that goes all red to make it white. And we've got this movie that starts to lean into the blues to make it cool, right? Yeah. I yeah. probably said what you were going to say, Evan. I'm sorry. Ish. I was more like less uh, temperature wise and more like clear skies versus cloudy skies and, and that's, having that, that effect. That's something else they talk about too, about the, the, the problem of, um, you know, in low budget filmmaking, you don't stand in, in big budget movies, as you probably know, Evan, you will stand around and wait for the clouds. You know, you want the clouds, you'll stand and wait for them to come in. You don't want them, you'll stand and wait for them to go out. In low budget filmmaking, you may not have uh, that as an option. So he also does talk about, you know, we did a lot of the waiting around. Yeah, the, he does talk about doing a lot of color correction to try to deal with the skies as well that were not exactly what they had, had intended them to be all the time. What else, guys? Did they? I don't recall them actually saying the name of the town they were in. It was just kind of like an every town for hillbillies. Yeah, I don't think they do. I don't even know if it is <laughs> town necessarily. You know, it may just be you know a county somewhere. Um, you know, with these sort of scattered homes about rather than an actual. You know, it may not be in the the, the uh, city limits of a town. I don't. I don't know. I mean, I know, I know, even when they describe where the film was shot, they don't talk about cities or towns, they talk about counties. Um, so, um, but the, the, the culture in that part of Missouri and in the Ozarks is something that was very important to Deborah Granick to capture, it's something that's, that she found was very sort of uh, evocative in the novel and she wanted to really capture that. Um, 
And to some extent, the, the way that they capture that is by filming in the actual place and using the real people and using the real costumes and using the real locations. And basically, instead of taking a story and creating the environment, you the environment is there, the story is then placed inside it. Yeah, that was the one thing I did notice, like they nailed that part of that aspect of the movie was like, yeah, this is Hillbillyville right here. Yeah. Well, and that's because that's where they are, right? So you can imagine, you know, uh, I think it's interesting to imagine this. And I think it's something we can talk about later. Um, but I always find this an interesting uh, idea, right? So Deborah Granick is an, er, and, 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 um, or Annie uh, Rossellini, th these are urban filmmakers. You know, uh, Deborah Granick went to NYU. She lived in Boston. Um, this is a foreign country to her, which I think to some extent is what makes it so interesting to her. Um, and a lot of her films deal with, you know, most of her films deal with, with lower class working people, you know, not the kind of environment that she comes from. Um, so, you know, I think it's very important for her as a filmmaker to be, to, to make this movie feel real, to be in this real place with these real people. Um, the wardrobe, for example, um, all the wardrobe is real people's clothing. In fact, what they figured they, they decided to do, um, you know, except for sometimes they would, they would have to, you know, for someone like Reed, they have to have doubles, you know, because if something happens to a clothing or it gets something on it, you got to go back and do take two, you have to have multiples. Um, but for most of the costuming, what the wardrobe uh, people did was they, they, they went, you know, to the people that they were, filming around and filming with and the extras and the people on the locations. And they basically did swaps. They said, you give us your old clothes, we'll give you new clothes. So that when you see these people wearing these things, they're wearing stuff that's really truly worn. You know, um, the, the costumer talks about the fact that people in this part of the country, you know, often only have one coat. And if they're hunters, that coat needs to be camouflaged. So that's the only coat they've got. Um, and you, you don't see, you don't see a lot of wardrobe changes in, in this movie. Um, so that's another way of kind of getting in the realism. They, they would go into somebody's house and they basically shoot the way that, you know, you know, what's most common in movies is you find a location and then you completely change it to match your story. You take all the furniture out, you take all the dressings out, you build a new, uh, you know, I worked on a movie once where we took the kitchen and we put it on the porch and then put it on the porch and then took the, it took the living room and put it where the kitchen was and, you know, you, you know, taking out walls. This is, you walk into the location and this is it. This is what's informing our story, right? The stuff that's there, the stuff that's on the walls. Uh, this is, this, this is, this is, this is our location. This is our environment. This is our setting. Um, so they really, they, they lean into this. You know, you have a scene like the, the scene where Re goes to investigate the idea of, of joining the army for the money. Yeah. And she has this, this, this interaction with this recruiter. Well, that guy's a real recruiter. That's, that's not an actor. Uh, that, 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 that's a guy doing on camera what he does in real life, which I think is the important characteristic there. Deborah Granite talks about how really valuable that is to have a situation in which you've got people who are not actors but are real and people who are not real but are actors and the way in which they can sort of work together to support each other to create this, you know, sort of synthesis of um, reality. I think I heard somebody. Is there some, somebody got something? Where are you now, guys? Uh, I was going to say that I really enjoyed the film because the whole uh, feeling of the movie, to me, it hit home okay. because I grew up in that environment of where we were all just poor and we all had to rely on each other to get stuff or we had to hunt for everything that we had. But I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it because it made me feel like, oh, well, this is just like I grew up. And you know, uh, around town, there was people that were like uh, her uncle who were so strung out on crack and coke. You know, if a sheriff ever pulled them over, the sheriff already knew who they were because they done arrested them already so many times. 
and then they would sort of back down and stuff like that. So I really enjoyed the film for that aspect of it. But uh, even though I enjoyed it, do we ever get an explanation of who, like, who it was at the end who gave the money? No. Okay. No, that is left open. Is there any speculation on who it could be? Well, what about you? Do you have any ideas? Do you have any thoughts? The only person I I could truly come up with is the, uh, I forgot her name, but the lady in the beginning that she drops the horse off to. Okay. Uh, the only reason why I say that is because, you know, it's just like Jennifer Lawrence made a comment. She said, don't ask for anything that's not offered to you. She'll right. come over and stuff like that. So in my mind, you know, she noticed whenever the sheriff was over, you know, she was being nosy, stuff like that. She sort of got the feeling of she knew what was going on. And then, of course, I'm, I'm assuming that was her husband that picked her up or brother or whoever she lived with. Uh, whenever he picked her up and took her to the burnt down house, uh, Jennifer Lawrence, I was, in my mind, I was like, OK, they put the pieces together and she could possibly be the one who paid it off. <clears throat> and that's a really good possibility. Uh, you got something on that, Braden? Uh, well, yeah, I was going to say, I, I thought it was that um, it was like that, that hillbilly lady or the people posted his bail to get the dad out so they could kill him. And then they just left the money with the family. That that, it was, that's my take on it, too. In fact, uh, and, and again, the movie doesn't say, so we can speculate in whichever way we want to. My, right. my take on it is that it's not something that was done um, it's, it's not something that was done to sort of, to sort of help Re or help Re's family that the bond was laid down so that, and that there's a very good chance that someone like Thump is kind of behind it. Um, that the money is laid down so that they could get him out of jail and they could take him out and kill him before he, he, you know, uh, I, I imagine before he says something that would incriminate the others and that it's then just as incriminating to go back and try to get the money, uh, you know, so they just let the money go and it ends up going to re. That's, that, that's my take, but again, the movie doesn't tell us. So it's one of those sort of open-ending issues. We can kind of finish the story um, in our own way. What else, guys? Um, I was gonna say that, that the, the recruiter scene actually was not realistic for me. Okay. I did not like that scene. Okay. But this is my little, this is me. This is my own personal bias. I'm, I'm from the military in a military community. If it's an army recruiter, it would not have played out like that. An army recruiter would have been like, oh, you're here for the money? All right. Oh, well, yeah. you need a parent to sign? Oh, oh, he would have gone to her house, saw the like comatose depressed mother and like took her hand and signed the paper for her and, and then we would have had a totally different movie <laughs> this, the, 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 yeah, so, yeah. Uh, but I, I, you I know i it, think i think it works for general audiences but i think anybody that's been in the army would have seen this recruiter and been like bullshit <laughs> i i wonder also if it doesn't for me because i i'm i'm aware of what you're saying as well that for me it works because it's like playing against type it's not what i expect this guy to be this is not the way these guys normally are. And it gives me a little bit of a, a kind of different insight. Um, but you do have the situation too, where, where, you know, this guy is to some extent helping to write his own scene. You know, um, he's the one who's helping the filmmakers figure out how this would go and may very well be playing himself as a little bit nicer or who knows, this may be the one nice army recruiter. You never, you never know. Right. But I did feel it was a reversal. It was um, a, a shift for me. It's a shift in expectations. My expectation is going to go the way the way you you say, Brighton. And I find it interesting because it doesn't go that way. Um, but no, I totally totally get what you what you mean. Yeah. What else, guys? Thump is another one, by the way, who is just a local. Um, in fact, Deborah Granick's follow-up film to this is a documentary called Stray Dog, which is about the guy who plays Thump. Um, his wardrobe is very interesting because instead of dressing him as they suspected his character would be, they used elements 
of his actual wardrobe and his own personality in order to create that character. So the sort of biker uh, vest that he wears um, is something that is actually his because he is in reality a, a biker. Um, and I haven't had a chance to see that documentary yet, but I'm, I'm really trying to track it down because I think it sounds really, really interesting. What else, guys? Got about 15 minutes. You know, I'll just start talking if you guys don't, so. Does the director have any recent films? Um, yes, um, and this is an interesting, who is this by the way? Oh, Julian, me. Julian, okay, thank you. I've been, I've been wondering who Obama was, and I, I, it's, it's <laughs> funny, because when I look at the videos of this, it doesn't put your names up on it. The names are obscured. Are taken out so I always go who is who, who am I talking to now um yes and in fact this is an interesting thing to talk about I think you know we we looked at that slide earlier about um and in fact I'm going to look for something I, I suspect my photos are gone which is going to be very disappointing um we, we talked about the sort of of impediments that appear to be in place for women filmmakers uh, yeah, it's all gone, to, to sort of move through the chain. You know, we've got people like Colin Trevorrow, who's making a really low budget independent film, and the next thing he's making is a giant franchise Star Wars movie or a giant franchise Jurassic Park movie. We've got David F. Sandberg, who, you know, does a three minute horror movie, and the next thing we know he's doing a DC movie. Um, and women filmmakers, although again, it's getting better, especially in the last year, women filmmakers don't seem to have that trajectory. So even though Winter's Bone was enormous, it was financially successful, it was critically acclaimed, it was nominated for four Academy Awards, Deborah Granick spent the, 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 the last 10 years, right, it's 10 years, um, really struggling to get another movie made. And the only thing she could get made up until I think 2018 was this Stray Dog documentary. But either in 2017 or 2018, she had a, she finished a film and I haven't, it's, it's in my queue and I, I haven't seen it yet and I really wanna see it, called Leave No Trace, which is either on Amazon Prime or on Netflix. It's, it's out there, it's available. Do you guys, by the way, you know, if you guys are, ever trying to track down, um, I'm not looking over room, uh, are ever trying to track down where movies are screaming, there's an incredible app, if you're not aware of it, called Just Watch, which basically you can go in, you can tell the app, these are the services I have. Um, it'll give you a daily update of what has been added to those services. You can search for a particular film, it'll tell you where it's free or where you can pop buy it. So. Um, it's really valuable if you're looking for movies. Um, but Leave No Trace, um, a, 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 a film about um, um, a, a veteran and his daughter who are basically living rough um, in the woods and the, the sort of uh, problems and issues that are faced when society kind of figures this out and decides that this is not an appropriate way to raise a child and uh, begins to get involved. Um, so that's the only fiction feature she has managed to get made and financed, although she's tried a lot, but she's managed to get made and financed since Winter's Bone, Leave No Trace. What else, guys? Um, I think uh, just on the, uh, the idea of women in, in the film industry, I think, I mean, we live in such reactionary times that when when you try to switch things around and when you try to put like a woman protagonist or you try to do those things, people explode. And then it be, that in and of itself becomes a thing that people argue about and it kind of draw, takes away from the film. Like Captain Marvel was one of these ones. Yeah. You know, after that, where it was like, everyone was- Star like, Wars. Like, yeah, yeah, Star Wars, another great example with Laura Dern, where it was like, everyone gets upset and starts really getting hypercritical about the character. You know, and, and, and whether or not she's there for just to push a feminist, a quote unquote, feminist agenda, or, you know, and it's just Let like, me correct one thing. Let's not say everybody. Right, right, yeah. But a very, yeah, very yeah. vocal. It's, yeah, a very vocal sliver of Twitter and YouTube film critics. Yeah. 
Um, but it just, it just, and it, but it becomes what seems to drive the marketing almost of the films. And it kind of, I, I, it, it's, it's like every time there's a design, every time there's a step forward, there's always seems to be a reaction against that and a response to it, as I guess I would like to comment. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, eventually when you, when you see things that are so out of balance as this is, I mean, so incredibly out of balance, um, there's a there's a force that's going to fight against changing the status quo especially by those who are benefited by the status quo um and and you know and, and sometimes you know you sometimes some, sometimes actions have to be taken you know there is the inclusion rider um that has been um uh created uh that is a writer that goes into a contract for a major star that basically kind of, and, and you know, we can talk about how, we don't even have to talk about this. Obviously this is both great and problematic at the same time. It basically says in the making of this movie, you know, the, the, the filmmakers will be inclusive. They'll make sure that there are people of color and that there are women in these characters. Uh, and if you don't do that, you don't get me, you don't get Jennifer Lawrence um today um in your movie um but sometimes you gotta just take actions to kind of fix something that's this completely um ridiculously uh, skewed out of uh, uh, just ridiculously skewed um i'm gonna back up one second julian i also forgot to mention there is a previous feature to this called Deborah Granick is also trying to make another movie that has bone in the title her previous film to winner's bone was a movie called down to the bone uh, which um is it, it, it's it's another movie with vera formiga um kind of her the movie that kind of launched her career um as as a, a, a drug addicted mother uh kind of you know probably a lot I, again i haven't seen it probably a lot like what winter's bone would be without the the thriller sort of subtext what else guys All right, I'm looking at my PowerPoint to see if I can, uh, I can come up with something that will poke at you a little bit. What do you think of the music? What 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 function does the music play? So it was very, like the first song when she goes into that birthday party i guess you call it mm -hmm. the song itself is a little more upbeat than i would have thought what well, and how nate how would you describe the music country in general i don't know i can't think of a good word for it this it is to some extent kind of hillbilly in a way i guess that, that's well, they got they play banjos program. and fiddles and stuff they got the classical instruments going on yeah but it really wasn't you know that backwoods redneck sound it was something different it, and and again it's something very specific from the area so um it's also something that's generated by the location um so um meredith cisco who is the woman that you see singing um in one of the scenes um is a regional musician you know that group that she is playing with is a regional group that is authentic regional music um she was hired by the production when they found her to kind of provide a lot of the the, the music that is used throughout the film so once again that is something that's been you know that's 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 been not necessarily added to the story but it's been pulled from the location again in an attempt at least you know at at a score you know and a, a music bed that is authentic to the story and authentic to the region uh let's see one of the other things that might be worth just just mentioning and it's something you can think about um Braden was talking about the scene with uh, Teardrop and the sort of frantic camera work that happens there. Um, 
there, there's something else that happens in the way the movie is put together. And I don't know if you guys have any thoughts about this or not. Um, you know, the camera is never t completely still. It's handheld. We can tell it's handheld. It roams, it catches things. It, you know, it has a documentary kind of feeling to it. Um, but then interspersed through the film are these, these tableaus, these, these still lifes, these moments where we just sit for a moment and we focus on a detail. Did you guys notice that going on? Anybody? Well, then I will suggest that when you watch the PowerPoint, you watch the video called Details, uh, a video essay on um, Winter's Bone. Um, I, I know what you're talking about, kind yeah. of like with the chickens, and I, even that scene, the birthday scene, where it's like showing them singing and stuff, and it yeah. feels a lot like a lot of world building. It just kind of adds to the authenticity of. Yeah, I think there's, there's a shot of, uh, uh, you know, the daughter, the toys of the of the kids on the porch and you know, things like that. Um, did any, this is something else just brought up, did anybody recognize the actress who is playing um, um, the father's mistress that, that Ree goes to visit? And I think during that party scene, if I recognize her, if you are a Twin Peaks fan, um, and a David Lynch fan, you should recognize that that is Laura Palmer. I, I didn't even recognize that. I did yeah. recognize the lady who uh, is like the redhead. She's like the go-to woman anytime that somebody needs a hillbilly. She's yeah, that's Dale, that, that's Dale Dickey. Um, Great, I love you her. Know, the last thing I remember seeing her in, um, and I thought she was terrific in, was Iron Man 3, where she is the, the mother of um, one of the victims that Tony Stark goes, um, goes to visit. Um, we, we've got just about four minutes left. So let me ask you if anyone has a take on the dream sequence. Do you even remember the dream sequence? Uh, can you uh, remind me? Because I actually watched the movie like two weeks ago. Okay, so after she is beaten up, um, and she is taken back um, and she is recovering. She's laying in the bed with her, her brother and sister. And she had, there's this very strange black and white sequence shot in a smaller sort of square frame. It looks like, and I think was in fact shot on like eight millimeter film or super eight millimeter film, maybe 16 millimeter film. Um, and it's about a squirrel. Does that ring a bell? I don't super remember that, yeah. but I, it, yeah, I don't know. Well, you know, a lot, a lot of people do sort of wonder um, why that is there. Um, I, I know how I react to it, and I know that it cannot, it's unlikely that this is anything that the filmmakers were thinking about. Um, I, I think to some extent it's it's just a matter of of getting in getting in Ree's head at that moment and you know the she she's so um she's so against taking drugs but she's got to take these painkillers and it's just kind of doing something to her head and they've been out you know they've been out hunting and skinning squirrels isn't this at least the second time and doesn't doesn't she do this in two movies doesn't she do this in a, a Hunger Games movie as well a kill a kill a squirrel um and I just think this is what's in her head. But to me, um, when I start to think about this movie as a country noir, and this is where we'll end up today, I guess, as a country noir, as, a, as, as, as sort of a, 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 what is referred to often, the modern noir movies, you know, neo-noir. Um, there's always a scene in a noir movie in which the detective, right, who's looking for someone, is beaten to a pulp in that pursuit. And it often has some kind of situation in which as they're beaten up and they lose consciousness, there's some kind of effect that goes on, things begin spinning. And then the detective will later wake up with kind of a new idea, uh, you know, uh, a revelation of some kind. Um, that helps move it forward. I don't think the squirrel is a revelation, but it does, it does, it, 
to, for me, just for me, it reminds me of those, those situations in which, you know, the detective always gets beaten up and then has to kind of recover over some course of time. Dealt with in a much more realistic fashion, obviously, here. But I think the real, the real point of this, I think, is the, the effect that, you know, this drug that she really doesn't want to take is, is kind of happening. Any last thoughts, guys? It's almost like she has a guilty conscience for shooting the squirrel. Maybe. And it also kind of foreshadows the chainsaw at the end. Well, there's that, too. Yeah. How do we feel, in the last minute or so, how do we feel about that scene? The pawn scene? The chainsaw scene? Yeah. yeah. It's awesome. <laughs> I liked whenever um, the grandma or whoever however they were related i like when she was like you got to get both hands everybody knows that trick yeah <laughs> yeah like that was the one scene yeah. where i actually a common event people. i'm sorry say again everybody knows uh i watched this with my family and when she said that we all started laughing because she said everybody knows that trick yeah. like to cut off one hand and drop it off at the police station yeah <laughs> evidently happens all the time yeah. We, had, um, we had the exact opposite reaction in my house. I was watching it, and my, my mother walks in the room, and me and my dad are kind of looking at it, and she's like, what the heck is on my TV? I'm like, my, my bad. We're cutting off a hand. Just kind of relax. It's good. <laughs> you know, I think, you know, I'll, I'll just leave you with this. Um, the, the goal of the quest, the achieving of the goal of the quest, cannot be easy. It has to be hard. If it's not difficult, if it doesn't take a toll, it doesn't have any emotional resonance. And in the end, she's been beaten up. There's a lot going on, but in the end, she is handed the goal. No pun intended, no pun intended. right? She is given the goal. It can't be that easy. There's got to be, she's got to bring something to the table. And what she has to bring to the table is, Cutting off at least, I think she cuts off one hand and then Dale Dickey cuts off the other, if I remember correctly. Am I remembering that right? Um, but it's got to, it's, hold the arms it's, up it's while, it, say again? He has to hold the hands up while uh, the other lady cuts them. Yeah. But there's got to be, it, it's, it's got to be difficult. There's got to be a toll that's, that's, that's paid um, for achieving this, this goal. All right, let me ask you something, guys. We, we've kind of finished up with this. Um, I'm going to schedule office hours for reading day. It will probably be in the afternoon. I'll send an email out about that. Um, we have the final exam period coming up. I'm perfectly happy just kind of open up a, a, a Zoom session and we can just talk about, and whoever wants to come can come and we can just talk about whatever we want to talk about in terms of movies. Um, and in fact, let me just say, I'll send an email. That's what I'm going to do. If no one shows up, I will just go about my business. If anybody does show up, we can just talk about what we've done this semester or, you know, we can, we can talk about the things that we've done for our projects. We can share with each other. I think it would be a great opportunity to kind of, get into some topics and some subjects that aren't the things I'm dictating to you. So I'm, I'm not going to require it, but I am going to set it up and I'm hoping to see some of you, uh, some of you there for that. Um, you will be getting an email about, you know, explaining a little bit more detail about the test here just in the next probably few minutes, if I can, can get it done before I have to leave for an appointment. Um, any last questions or comments on what is our last official class? Uh, when did you say that other Zoom meeting was going to be? It will be, um, it will be during the final exam period, which is on the 7th. From 10 to 12. From 10 to 12. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah, at the end of which your projects or papers are last minute are due. Last, last, last minute are due. So the 12th is our final due date? Um, no, the ninth is your final right. due date for the test. Noon, uh, your paper or project is the seventh at noon, the final exam and the extra credit, also the seventh at noon, the final exam taken on D2L, the deadline for that is noon on the ninth. Okay. Okay. And again, I'll put all that in an email that I'll send out here in just a little while. 
Any last questions or comments? I want to say thank you to Evan Hunter and Steve Jarrett who have joined us for most of these sessions. They've done better than 90% of the class the students in the class with their attendance. Um, Steve, you got anything to offer here at the end here, Mr. Professor? I got nothing. All right. <laughs> Take his class. Uh, <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to sign off then so I can get some emails out to you guys, and hopefully I'll see some of you on the set. Take care, everybody. Thank you for a great semester.